remember as if it were yesterday what happened when I had my first big aha moment in treating children who were struggling with obesity. Actually, two aha moments hit me at once, like a double sonic boom. I was working in pediatric clinic. Adolescents with obesity began coming to me for help. This was the 1980s. Childhood obesity just wasn't on the radar screen of pediatric training back then. Nothing in my training had prepared me for this. I had been treating one particular patient, a 12-year-old girl I'll call Renee. Like most of the children I was working with, Renee was having terrible trouble losing weight. It seemed like no matter how much behavior change we worked on, these kids could just not lose weight, at least not enough to make them happy or healthy. The parents and the children would confirm that yes, the kids were sticking to the diet plan that we had agreed on. And yes, they were getting the minimum amount of physical activity every day. Believe me, these kids wanted a change. They were desperate to lose weight and be like other kids. They were desperate to look like other kids. They would do anything, whatever it took. But whatever we did, their weight stubbornly refused to budge. Renee's parents were mystified. I was mystified. And at the same time, many of my colleagues were mystified, too. In 1988, when I started a weight management clinic for children, no one in my hospital had ever seen such a thing. I took some ribbing. Some of my colleagues asked me why I even bothered. This was before we had even given a name to the childhood obesity epidemic. There was no protocol for identifying factors that contributed to childhood obesity. There weren't many articles or books about childhood obesity back then. There was no protocol for helping to work with children to normalize their weight. There were no drugs specifically indicated to influence children's metabolism. Instead, there was just skepticism, including from among the professional community. Hey, Sandy. Why are you taking care of these kids? They don't need you. They just need to eat less and exercise more. I knew by then it was a lot more complicated than eat less, exercise more, but I still didn't know why. I was just stumped. I realized I had no idea how to help these patients. I had no idea how to define the problem in medical terms or who could be of help. I didn't even know what questions to ask. I knew I needed to understand what would help me help my patients. So I did what anyone would. I started with the tools that I had. I had come out of my pediatric training with a template for the expert encounter. And this template was built around being an expert. I would first ask my patients the history of present illness and then ask a series of thoughtful and pointed questions about their family history and specific symptoms. But with no body of knowledge to draw on, I was forced to turn to the only experts I knew, my patients and their families. I had to stop playing the role of expert and put myself in the position of the learner. I started to listen as my patients began to teach me about what was happening to their bodies, their desire to look like everyone else. I tried to figure out what the hidden truth was in this situation. I came up with new and different questions. I started asking children about their days, from morning till night, what they ate, what they did with their time, their relationships with their family and peers, how their bodies felt, what they were feeling, and in listening, I started to learn. As time went on and more patients came, I got better at asking questions, at using information that was in those days largely coming from adult medicine, and putting together a plan. This was a very linear process information in and plan out. My body of knowledge was increasing. I learned what the most important questions were to ask young children struggling with obesity. First, you get a good picture of the family food dynamics and behavior patterns, and then you ask, how is that behavior working for you? Why is that behavior working for you? What benefits are you getting out of it? And often the answers were surprising. 
Sometimes parents of a child with autism might say, we eat fast food every night of the week. Because when we go through a drive through it's much easier to have a calm meal than when we're at home sitting around the dinner table. If you ask children why they're not going outside, why they're not getting any exercise, sometimes you hear that they live in a dangerous neighborhood. Going outside can be hazardous to your health. Asking questions and getting answers like these is giving me a post, post, post graduate education. My knowledge base was building. Meanwhile, around the country, the obesity epidemic was building too at an explosive rate. I could see it in clinic. I could see that the struggle my patients were having to manage their weight was increasing. Younger and younger patients were being brought into clinic by their parents. It reached a point where we even had a special clinic just for children under five years old. Children were coming into clinic at higher and higher weights, presenting with diseases like type 2 diabetes and liver disease, previously only seen in adults. By now, we were well into the obesity epidemic, and it seemed like all the behavior change in the world couldn't completely resolve their struggles with weight. All of this was background to my, du my double aha moment with Renee. One day, I remember looking at Renee's growth chart. A growth chart is a tool we use all the time in pediatrics, and it looks like this. In healthy children, there is an orderly progression of height and weight growth that is actually quite lovely. A picture of the synchronicity of the complex system that is the body moving through time. I was looking at Renee's growth chart, something I had done hundreds of times, when I suddenly realized that without drugs or surgery, Renee's steady rate of weight gain had slowed. Why? There was only one factor that was different. Over the time that we had worked together, Renee's weight had returned to the normal curve because of something about our encounters. Something about my interaction with Renee and her family had caused a physiologic change, a slowing in her rate of weight gain. This meant that Renee's energy balance had changed without drugs, without surgery, what had caused this change? And then my second insight hit me. The patient encounter was the vehicle for the change, physical, measurable, quantifiable change. This was important. It meant that doctor-patient interaction wasn't just a corollary of Renee's improvement. This improvement wasn't a coincidence. There was clear and definite causation at work here. Something about our relationship our interaction or communication was fueling a change in my patient, but how did it work? I began thinking about what was happening, and I realized that my relationship with Renee and her family had evolved far beyond me simply giving medical information and advice. We were connecting on a deep human level. We were communicating in a way that resulted in a sense of hope being generated, a feeling that healing was possible that they were able to have an influence over their own health and environment. And in this moment, I realized the true power of the patient encounter. We were not just exchanging information to get to a diagnosis. We were interacting in a way that somehow created the possibility and space for healing to occur. You see, for parents and children to achieve a healthier strategy, they have to be open to change and believe that it is possible. And I was learning that so many families simply did not have that hope. They were resigned. They may even be in despair, but they don't think there's anything they can do to change their situation. By then, the obesity epidemic was exploding. Obesity rates had tripled in children from 5% in 1980 to about 15% of all children in 2000. And we were still slow to recognize that we were facing a crisis. It wasn't until 2002 that the journal Pediatrics published a commentary entitled Childhood Obesity, a New Pandemic for the New Millennium. And it wasn't until 2003 that the US Surgeon General declared we were facing the childhood obesity epidemic. But while the nation's medical establishment was coming to grips with the reality of this crisis, I was having my third aha moment. This insight can be summed up in two words. Context matters. For many years, I had been meticulously asking my patients about their activity, their eating, their sleeping, their family and peers, work and school. 
And as a clinician, I had been very much focused on my individual children, children and families, helping them to achieve a healthier lifestyle in a very personalized way. This was important, but it was only taking us so far. Something was missing. I remember attending a research conference on the environmental causes of obesity. Then and there, I realized that all the individual behavior we were struggling with in clinic had a correlate in the environment. It hit me with overwhelming clarity that all the willpower in the world couldn't overcome an obesity-causing environment. Context mattered. What surrounded my patients became part of them. Sodas at school, candy at the corner store, chips in the cupboard, all screens and no sleep, school schedules that eliminated physical education and recess, teasing and bullying, communities that were unsafe or unwalkable, lack of access to healthy food and fresh produce. The context of the family mattered. The context of the school mattered. And the context of the community mattered. And context not only mattered for each individual patient I treated, it mattered across the board for our entire population of children. The state of the community, the school, and the work environment, all of these collectively made the difference between a healthy community or a community of children with obesity. The more I understood about the context of my patients and families, the more I could use this knowledge to help them navigate their environment, and the more I was becoming an advocate. I started sharing my knowledge about the causes of obesity with my colleagues. I started speaking in the community. I talked about the need to listen, and about the patient encounter was the most precious thing we had. It could be our most powerful tool. Just talking with patients and their families can change the possibilities of their lives. And when parents and children have their own aha moments, they can go on to internalize those insights and act accordingly. I got active in my professional association, the American Academy of Pediatrics. I talked to legislators, foundations, and corporations about what was happening to children, the nutrition and activity environment. And just to show that no good deed goes unpunished, I was asked to testify before the United States Senate on the impact of childhood obesity on the health of our population. And one of the messages in my testimony was that we are failing these children and their families. And we are mistaken when we point a finger at children with obesity and say, if you just had more willpower, you would not be overweight. A child's decision to make a healthy choice means nothing if there are no healthy options in the environment. And believe me, there are many food deserts out there where this is true. There is food, but it's junk, void of any nutritional value. A child can eat and eat and eat because their body is hungry, craving the healthy nutrition they need. But no matter how much junk these children eat, they will never get the healthy nutrition they need because it simply isn't there. That is why our children, through no fault of their own, end up in a paradoxical state. They are forced to live with a double burden of obesity and hunger. Eat less and exercise more is not a realistic prescription, but neither is eat better or live someplace where it's safe enough to exercise. These are issues children can't control and many families can't control. That is why many of us feel that good, healthy food is a civil right. At the very least, providing good, healthy food to our children, all of our children, is enlightened self-interest. If we continue to fail our children in this regard, we will be paying a price down the line in exploding health care costs. We are already paying the price. Since my first encounter with an adolescent struggling with obesity so many years ago, I have been on a journey I never expected, a journey that began in ignorance and despair and ended with new knowledge and hope. Let me go back to that question I was asked when I was first starting to treat children with obesity. Why do you bother, Sandy? The real question is, is why do any of us bother? We bother because we are motivated by our love of our patients, or our love of science, or both. This is why we got in the game, to change people's lives and to create a healthier world. I'll tell you why I bother. I bother because I know the connections we make with our patients are incredibly powerful. This is how we give them the information they need, and more importantly, the hope they need, to overcome the epidemic of obesity and the diseases that go with it. Thank you.